you had to know that I wasn't going to start anywhere else. Of course, you got to be the first guest, Griff. And Griffin Conine is the first guest of the new podcast, of course, The Call Up. I wasn't going to have anybody else be the first guest. You were the first guest of Locked On MLB Prospects. I think you were one of my first guests on the other podcasts I've done through the years. Uh, but here we go. First guest on The Call Up, Griff, coming in from a hotel room in Jupiter. Thank you for hopping on, my friend. Absolutely honored to be the debut. I, I hope I can live up to uh, live up to the hype of the new the new pod, the call up. Oh, it's Thank just what what everybody's talking about right now. The hype. Yeah, yeah. But no, it, it's actually been exciting seeing the numbers on the first episode. We talked about some underrated prospects, and uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about your off season, what you've been working on. Um, also, I realize like you and I have obviously had a million conversations about twenty twenty one in the season for you, but. You know, we haven't really talked about it on air. Uh, so I think there's a lot of a lot of highs. There's some lows. It was a little bit of a roller coaster of a year for you, as I think you would say. But overall, I mean, I've said this to you a million times. It was a net positive. You almost hit 40 home runs. You figured things, a lot of things out about yourself as a hitter and as a player all around. And we're going to get into that. But I also kind of want to start with just what you've been working on in the offseason, because I think it's been really cool hearing some of the things that you're working on at the plate. but also athletically too you've been working on some speed some twitchiness some stuff in the outfield let's start with that because we're gonna end up talking forever about hitting uh talk a little bit about what you've been working on with just your other parts of the game uh yeah well uh i've actually had to take a little bit of a hitting break anyway um because six weeks ago almost six weeks ago uh, i had to get handmade reconstruct or not reconstruction uh handmade surgery which is just uh they take out the handmade bone. So I, I broke it um, doing a hitting camp in Jupiter, actually. Uh, and that was something that kind of came up last season towards the end of the year. Uh, my hand, like, was pretty sore for the last month or couple months. Um, and I thought it was just kind of, you know, an effect of taking 200 swings a day for several months. Um, and that was just soreness and it would go away. When the, the season ended and I could take a break, and then I kind of took some time off. And uh, started hitting again, you know, and then uh, I think late November, like after Thanksgiving, and it kind of was still, the pain was still there. It was, it was very dull, soreness, not nothing bad, easily play throughable. Uh, and then kind of one swing just like fully, fully cracked it. And I felt it immediately. And then uh, it was, yeah, it was pretty severe. Like I couldn't grip anything. I couldn't hold it. I knew it was like something was bad, badly hurt. Uh, we were joking when I was talking to you about it that we were hoping it was a handmade break because yeah. simple, simple procedure, simple recovery. Uh, if there was anything else, it would have been worse probably if it was tendon related or muscle related. Um, so yeah, they, they got back to us pretty quick. Got to get surgery like a week after that happened in December. Um, yeah, and then now I'm just about to be start hitting again Friday, which um very looking forward to uh but it also yeah it gave me some time to to work on some other stuff that definitely i needed to work on in the meantime it's funny because when uh when you texted me after the mri you're like I'm waiting to get the the results I'm like so we want it to be broken so when you texted me hammy bone is hammy bone is broken i was like congratulations i guess like it's good right because if it was something else then you know you're concerned right then it's like ligament damage or a different part of your hand where it's not something you can just take out. It's like, as far as my, my understanding is, it's almost like the appendix of your hand, right? It does nothing good at this point in our evolution. And really you can just take it right out. Yeah, exactly. They, uh, they just take out the fractured bit. It's like a little hook. It's like, a, it comes off like a hook uh, right in this part of your hand. Um, that's kind of, Oh yeah. Not really developed yet. Um, but uh, it comes off like a little hook. So a piece of the hook breaks. That's like the immense pain that you feel. And then, um, so they take that part out, the broken part, and then they shave down the rest of it. So it's like, it's nothing. It's kind of just a gap there where it used to be. And then that's where um, a bunch of scar tissue like floods in. That's kind of like the the only tricky part of the recovery. Yeah. Or not tricky, but like, you know, there's a huge scar tissue buildup. So it takes a while to uh, to get that back down to where I can swing again. But we're almost there. So you just got to manage that. And uh, you, you've been working a little bit on like speed and twitchiness and stuff like that as well. Right. I mean, you said you, you told me uh, off the air, of course, you've been feeling pretty good. Like you've gained a step or something as, as you've worked on that. Right. 
Yeah. 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 There, I, I started, I used to always, um, every off season I've done my workouts on my own, um, just in my house or the gym near my house, never had a trainer. Uh, I just like kind of doing stuff on my own. That was kind of my, uh, my little Zen, um, where I could just like work on whatever. I, I, th- I think I, I felt like I had like lifting figured out in a way. Cause I was, you know, if you're strong, like you feel like what more do you need, but yeah. there's so much more that goes into it than yeah. that. And then strong. Um, and I, I started to learn that. Um, so someone reached out to me about a gym that, that was actually really close. only two miles away from uh, my house in the off season. So, um, yeah, I got to meet this, uh, the speed coach that, that worked there. That was actually, um, I learned a, a ton from him and, uh, I started, I went there for about probably two months all together, maybe two and a half. Um, and yeah, it was, it was pretty interesting and eye opening, just learning about, um, running technique and like, uh, how I was basically, yeah, I never was coached on running at all. Never in my life. You know? And that's like, that's something that's pretty consistent. Like you wouldn't, you'd be surprised like in, in college, I mean, there's marginal coaching going on, but there's so many guys, you know, you got 45 guys on a team. You really can't, the, the, it's all generalized. It's all like a very general mold that like can fit 40 guys. So like what I need is going to be way different than what someone else needs or someone that's more flexible, more mobile. So um, it was cool to get like one-on-one work and learn how um, basically how you're supposed to efficiently run and like move and, and take off. And that's a, so, so big for me is acceleration and something that I've, I don't think I'm very good at, or I wasn't in the past. Um, I feel like I had a good top speed. That's why like my 60 would always be decent, decent enough. But like if the, the, the less the yardage went, the, the kind of, yeah. um, I went up the scale as, as like more closer to average or, or even below. So, um, we did mostly like short bursts, like 10 yard, 20 yard splits. And, um, yeah, it was pretty cool to see like a, a pretty significant increase in like such a short distance. Like I was, I started with like one, I was running like one, eight, one, seven, like upper one, seven, 10 yard splits, which is like not very good. It's probably, you know, average at best, maybe below even. Um, and then by the end, you know, uh, he just gave me one kind of cue about um, improving dorsiflexion and improving shin angle, which are two like pretty important things. And like my ankle mobility was really bad. So I was spending a lot of time, you know, just working on opening that up a little. Um, but once that clicked, I, I was easily, I was getting like one sixes, one five eights, um, which is like, you know, a two tenth jump almost in like a pretty short distance, like a two tenth jump in a 60 is pretty big. Cause yeah. that's six, eight, six, for instance. And, uh, and I was getting that just in that 10 yards. Cause like, and it felt so, so different. It felt like night and day from, from how I have been starting it, And a lot of it's just your setup. Like your ready position, as they call it, little league, is actually really, really important for how you're setting yourself up to take off. And I never really had given it much thought, and um, I absolutely will going forward. And, and I already have figured a lot of different stuff about that. Are we looking at like 15 bags next year? I don't know. You know, I haven't. I uh, will see, and I'm, I'm definitely gonna. I want to test it out in spring training. I want to <laughs> see how. Um, I'm getting away from high top cleats as well. That was on the coach's recommendation. No more Jordans? Um, uh, yeah, no. I, I ordered the Trouts, actually. They just got in. They look pretty nice. Um, never tried them. I've been wearing high-top cleats for every Forever. every year of football. Yeah, so – and then what that does is, like, it basically turns off your ankle in a way because your, your ankle is kind of immobilized. It's almost like you're taped up, right? Like – yeah. And like, I think that was just me like being, I, I used to roll my ankles a lot. And instead of like addressing the problem of being like, okay, you need to strengthen your ankles and then work on the mobility. I would just like wear high tops. So like they couldn't really roll. Um, so now I'm like, I have like kind of a routine that I do to make sure they're built up a lot better. And then, you know, now I feel like with lower cleats, I can actually, you know, I can move the right way. My foot can move the right way. So we'll you think see. It's going to translate into like outfield jumps and stuff too. Like that, that I feel like is something that, you see it starting to make its way into baseball savant where you can see outfielder jump and that's a percentile thing, but it's something you really look at when I'm looking at outfielders and looking at from the point of contact, how quick they're able to you know, get going. I feel like that's going to really help you in terms of closing in on balls too. Cause you said, once you get going, you're good. Uh, but that, that quick movement, that quick acceleration, it could really take you to the next level defensively. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I never really felt confident 
in the out, like I always knew my reads were good and, you know, I, I always felt confident getting good reads, but I never felt confident as far as like, if a guy smoked the ball in the gap, like it was going to beat me. It always felt like it was going to beat me. And like, now I feel like I at least have a chance to like, if you can get up to a, to your full speed that much quicker then you have a better chance to, you know, like Byron Buxton, he's at full speed two <laughs> after rides and yeah. obviously he's the best. I'll never be that good. Um, but like the closer you can get to whatever your max speed is, like that's huge. So I think I'm, I'll definitely without a doubt be closer because this is all new stuff that I never considered before, which is, yeah. is always cool. And people yeah. don't know. I mean, your, your brother Tucker is a division one track runner, your younger brother over at high point. So it, it, you got some speed in the genetics. I, your dad, we, we talked about it. You, you think you're, you're probably faster than your dad, but your dad could get going once he went a little bit, he had some stolen bases here and there. Uh, but yeah, he also he played a he played a noticeably heavier than than me, which is another, <laughs> at least at least you know after the first few years. So yeah. it was definitely hard for him to get going, get the get the, <laughs> so to speak. On the offensive side, of course, and I mean that's that's what you know you're going to make your living doing is is mashing. Of course, we, we talk about the defense because it's it's something that you're just making your game well rounded, and uh, you've got the arm, and and we're going to go over some of those highlights when we go live on Streamyard, but. Uh, the, the thing that I'm really excited about offensively is, is some of the things that you feel like you've, you've figured out uh, throughout this off season. I know you're chomping at the bit to really be able to apply some of these new moves and, and some of the things that looking back on 2021, which was a really good season in a lot of ways. And I mean, you really got to see what you are capable of, right? I mean, when you got hot, there was nobody in professional baseball other than maybe MJ Melendez uh, in the minor leagues that was hitting as many home runs and spurts that you were hitting, right? I mean, when, when it was clicking, it was clicking like as well as anybody you're going to find in pro ball. So you were able to take some of the positive, take some of the negative and kind of apply that into this coming season, right? And uh, without, without getting too into the nitty gritty, because we're going to get into that. And for those that are listening to this, we would have already went live on StreamYard and you can go check that out on our YouTube uh, where we're going to kind of be breaking down swings and stuff, looking at bonds, looking at of course, yourself too, Griff, and uh, talking about some of the moves that you've been looking at. But uh, w- what's been the main, if you could boil it down and simplify it as much as possible for those listening uh, that might not know that much about the swing, you know, what is the main thing that you're looking at to just try to consistently make more contact? Because we know the quality of contact. I mean, it's a joke. You, you don't have to worry about uh, what happens when you make contact. It's just doing it more frequently. Yeah, I think uh, well, the, one of the biggest things – beyond mechanically anything really i guess it it ends up being mechanics but um is just having like a consistent setup like i think if you look at if you look at like all my swings from last year you'll see like a lot a lot of different setups and i mean obviously the swing once it happens uh is relatively like you know you're really not going to change that much about your actual swing unfolding but like your stance and your setup and your load those things all and you see big league guy, you know, Harper, I saw him, he, he experimented a lot during his MVP year um, last year where like he would, he would have a toe tap sometimes. I saw him leg kick a couple of times. Um, and that's really hard to do. I think if you're, you can change more if, if the important factors of your swing are remain the same. Yeah. If, if the base of oh, when then Harper obviously did that, you can't do what he did. Um, if you're not, you don't have a really strong base. And like, I think, uh, despite the changes, there was a lot of important similarities in all his different approaches or, or loads that, that kind of got him to the same spot. And I think what happened with me was like, I would change things and yet um, the base would kind of fall away. Like I, I would change it too much to the point where I didn't really know who I was. Like I was kind of uh, struggling to, by the end of the season, it kind of, uh, it was so much change that like I, I couldn't get comfortable in the box. Like I, I didn't really, have a setup that felt comfortable I didn't know um like what I wanted my load to look like uh so a lot of that when then just talking to my dad who's like you know he had one of the most simple (laughs) approaches and swings ever I think that's like how he could play for so long was like he never really changed much about it he changed like he his changes talk when he talks about changes his were like going from his hands like from here to like here like that change like I don't think he's ever mentioned anything about his lower half like he did never change his lower half at all from what I've heard from what I what he's talking about is it's always it was always kind of just hands moving with him um 
And I think that's what you have to do. Like you have to, you have to pattern your lower half, however it works. Like if you're going to start open, whatever it is, it's got to be every time the same, the same. And, uh, and that way you can start to build like confidence with, okay, this is going to be at every time. Like I know where my, my hip's going to be. I know where my foot's going to land every time. And then you kind of freeze up a lot of room to like, you know, I'm worrying about it. You know, I felt like a lot of it last season, um, when things were going bad, I was worrying about like things not landing the way they are or my timing being off or um, a lot of that will sort itself out once you can nail down like a consistent approach. So like as soon as I pick up a bat starting Friday, um, that's the number one thing is like just, you know, whatever feels comfortable, like that's the most important thing to do. It's what feels comfortable. I, I, and I'm really excited to see that because baseball is so hard as is, right? So when you're trying to feel yourself out while also feeling out the pitcher, it's like that. If, if there's multiple things you have to think about in the box, it, it's, it's almost impossible. Right. And I mean, the, the thing was, is when you were making contact, it was a bomb. And, and that's the craziest thing. I always talk about it with you. You had the highest home run to fly ball percentage in all of professional baseball. That includes the major leagues, 46% of the balls you hit in the air left the yard, which you look at the list of major leaguers, the guys that, that, you know, were top in that category. It's, it's guys like Tati, Sotani, Vladdy. It doesn't really miss any of the best power hitters in that department. You talk about it. You're like, yeah, you know, I, I know that I can do that. I know that what I'm capable of, but it's also sticking with something that, you know, works consistently. And I, I, I know, I feel like for a lot of people, they're like, oh, well, look, the swings were working. Look at all these home runs he hit. Like, why not just keep doing that? What would be your, your response to that? Because you did have some home runs where you're going foul pole to foul pole, right? And it's like, oh, well, why don't you just repeat that? What is yeah. the response to that? You know what I'm saying? It, it, yeah. It's like a, a normal thought to have, but I know it's more layered than that. Yeah, well, like the hard thing to do with that is um, if you don't know, if you don't know everything about what you're doing when you're going well, everything meaning like everything down to where your weight's being held in your back foot and, and how your back hip is, is working as the ball, as, as you're approaching, you know, your, your, your launch of the swing and all that. If you don't know everything about your swing, it's going to, it's really hard to repeat it and to just yeah. do that. Yeah. Cause eventually like we don't, you know, we don't swing 24 hours a day. Like we yeah. go to sleep, we have BP and we do different things for BP every day. Like some days we'll hit off of an arm. Some days the guy like, you know, we'll face an arm. Some, some guys, the BP pitcher has to rest because his arm hurts. And then we face a kind of a, a crappy BP pitcher who may be thrown harder or softer. And then we get thrown off. It's that simple. Or like we face a machine, we do machine BP and then uh, the machine's throwing gas and like we're getting blown up and we can't get our timing. And like, that's as simple as that, as stupid as that sounds, like that's really what, like, what does it. And if you don't have a really, really strong knowledge of like your, swing and your setup and your body and like everything that you do when you go well um it falls off really quick and I think that's like that's when I would be going really well um you know it, it would be like a week or whatever you know a week in a row where it all just felt easy like it felt like you know I was doing the same thing there were no like uh, hiccups really there was nothing that threw me off and then you know sometimes even it was just the off day we have off days every Monday um and you got to let your body rest. Cause like, you know, we're playing 120 games, but um, sometimes the off day is like, that was all it took. Yeah. It was just like, you have an off day and then you get back in the cage on Tuesday for, for a game and um, you can't find it. Cause yeah. like, and as much as like, I write stuff down all the time about like all the feels I want to feel, all, all the feels I feel when I'm feeling good. Um, but even so like, that's sometimes that's not enough, you know, unless it's like the very key um, elements, which like, I think a lot of the last year I was focusing on the wrong things that, that weren't really, you know, there's only so many things your mind can focus on. And I was focusing on the wrong ones or maybe too many. So I think, you know, going forward, there's, there's a clear, there's a clear um, pattern to what all the big leaguers, all the great big leaguers, what, what their swings and loads do. And there, there's very clear things that they focus on. And I think that if you just focus on, what the greats do, you'll have a lot better chance of success. Yeah. And that's something, again, we're, we're going over, which I'm excited to go over with some swings uh, on the YouTube later. But I think that's a really interesting point is that you can get to a destination 
But if you don't know the directions that you took to that destination, it's going to be hard to get back there another time. Right. And, and I think that's the, that's the important thing here. And so you're taking those notes now and kind of finding you know, where those spots were that helped you get to the destination that you wanted to get to, but it, it makes sense. And what are some of those things that you're looking at now? Like what are, what are some of those components to your swing that you know will be your baseline uh, that you didn't know last year? And, and how have you kind of helped yourself figure that out? Uh, yeah, a lot of it's just like being a swing junkie. Like I, you know, I follow half the accounts I follow on Instagram are hitting, hitting accounts. And like, I, that, that gets, that can be get become tough when um, you got to take it with a grain of salt, almost like when things click in your mind, you latch onto those, but like, there's so many, so many different, I think, I, I think the ones, the selection that I have is pretty good because a, a lot of them are run by either like minor league hitting coordinators or even like there's some some guys at MLB time that run their own hitting accounts um, that are that post really good. They mostly post like big leaguers like they because it's hard to argue with. You know, I don't I don't follow like, you know, hitting guys that run cages that like have like kids they're coaching up because like that's when you can get into like trouble or they're like, you know, with, with up a 15 year old kid. You know, you're not going to it's very different to what. So like I've narrowed it down to like the accounts that give you the good stuff to like what the highest level hitters do at the major league level. And they were posting guys like Trout and Soto and Harper every day, different angles, different swings, different, um, different feels, maybe cage swings, maybe feels that they have in the on deck circle, really cool stuff. Um, and the, one of the biggest thing that sticks out is just like all these guys ability to like hold tension in their back hip for like a really, really long time. And I think, um, they all do it differently and they all do it like in a different way. Some guys have a longer load, some guys have a quicker load. Um, and sometimes it's hard to see. Sometimes it's hard to see, like you can't really tell that they're doing it almost. Um, but like the more that that clicked and the more that I think about when I was having like a hot streak, I think, I think um, that was something that I did automatically without really, you know, everyone it's most over one of the most overused things in, in baseball is like, Oh, the back hip, hold the back hip. Um, you hear that all the time, but like, that doesn't mean it. Those are just words like hold the back hip. What does that mean? Like, yeah, you know, just, just because that's the thing too, is, is I think people don't realize that certain words and phrases don't trigger the same thoughts and feelings for different players. So you, you might've been hearing that kind of terminology, but it seemed to just not really click until you saw certain things through this off season. Right. What, what kind of, yeah. what kind of helped it click for you at that point? Like, when did you really realize like, Oh man, I was really losing my back hip. And I was, I, that was a big reason why I was struggling with, with breaking balls at times, or uh, that was a big reason why, you know, I, yeah. I kind of lost, lost my lower half at times. There's actually a, a video. Um, it's kind of, it's kind of weird. Um, but one of the hitting accounts I follow posted a video of a, of a golfer that had the only one leg. So he only had his back leg. Oh my gosh. And, and it was him like on the tee box and he hit the crap out of a drive with one, with one leg. So like, imagine like a hitter that only has like his, I'm a lefty. I only have my left leg in the box. And, and I've seen, I've also seen guys like um, I've seen Christian Walker do it for sure. But I've seen guys do like one leg, like they'll lift one leg up and swing from one leg as like an on deck circle feel swing. Um, and, and I don't know how far the drive went. I mean, it probably went, it probably went, I don't think it went like 350, but it, he hit the, he hit it very hard. Like you could see in the video and like that kind of clicked for me in a way of like the back hip tension, like it never leaves really until like the barrels released. And I think, I think like I would, I would get away from it because uh, it's like a very tight feeling that you have when you're holding it the right way with tension. And, um, and it's like uncomfortable almost in a way that like, you'd want to like, you don't want to get, get out of it. I hear people say that too, like get off the backside so you can like get through it, which is like, that's wrong. Cause like wrong. as soon as you get off the backside, your arms have to like, your arms have to swing. Cause like when you don't have your backside firing, like through the ball, um, that's when like kind of everything gets out of sync. And that's when it gets really hard, becomes a lot harder to wait for, for off speed pitches because now you're just like, you're, you're throwing your arms at it instead of like hitting it with your, with your whole body. And I think that's what, like, that's what the major league guys 
have down so well. It's like they they hit the ball with their whole body. They don't just they, they look and it's that's why it's very hard to see. Like it looks like they throw their hands on an off speed pitch. Like they catch a curveball out in front. And you're like, wow, he just threw his hands at that. And that's and that's true in a sense. Like his hands did catch it out in front, but what happens behind the ball and the, and the way he the way he held tension the exact same way as he would on a fastball, and then he just released it and caught it more out in front. It's very different from oh, like he just flicked his hands at that. It's very hard to see though. It's so hard to see unless you don't know what, unless you know what like, what you're looking for. It, that that's that's the crazy point too. Is you know I feel like we, a lot of people are looking at swings and. They're oftentimes just looking at the wrong things, uh, especially when we see I see some like breakdowns and stuff from people on Twitter and they're like, oh, well, he moved his hands here and he moved this there and whatever. And I'm like, that's yes, th those are adjustments that the guy made, but that's not really going to change much. Right. Like if his issue is the lower half, nothing that he's doing up here is going gonna, is gonna to change anything. Um, and, yeah. and that's something that I, I think is really interesting when, when you were going right though. And, and that, like you talked about, like finding those commonalities, I, I, I just counted it up. You had a stretch where you hit 10 home runs in 13 games. That is, I don't know what the major league record is for home runs in a stretch of 13 games. Obviously this was when you were in high a uh, prior to your call up. And I think this is when every Marlins fan was actually pounding on the desk, like get Griffin Conine into double a, like bring that guy up to double a uh, that it was an absurd stretch for you. Uh, and then you actually had moments too in double a where, where you got really hot and you were seeing the ball really well. I think you had a series where you had, was it three oppo home runs in one series uh, where you were really feeling it in Pensacola? Yeah. How, yeah, much, yeah. how much would you say that? Cause I always talked about this on the podcast uh, when I was hosting locked on MLB prospects, I talk about it on here and I will is how big of a talent jump it is from high A to double. A. I mean, high A is good. I mean, we saw some really good arms when I, when I went and saw you out in South Bend, there was a lot of talent out there, of course, but double A is outrageous, especially last year when you had no 2020 season prior, it just seemed like there was just a stockpile of talent, especially arms wise in double A. Yeah. Yeah. There was definitely. Um, and for me, like my first series was uh, against the race. So we were in Montgomery on the road. Um, that was like my first uh, first trip with the with Pensacola. Um, so that was kind of like right into the teeth of the fire. It's like they had one of the they had a very very good pitching staff, and they had like the first guy I faced, um, Tobias Myers. Oh, he's uh, gross. Yeah, like he was having a really good year. Um, his spin rate is he is the one of the invisible type guys, but yeah. with Vila, not like throwing eighty eight. He was on like ninety four with with extreme ride. And, uh, I hadn't really seen that much of that. You know, we were, I saw fastballs up a lot and high. that was kind of, you know, what everyone throw, I think in all of the minors. Um, but when you have the spin rate and the top of the zone down and he did not like, he did not miss the top of the zone. And I think that was the difference was like the misses were very slim. Like not to say like, it's not the major leagues. Like you're not, you're not getting zero misses a game. Like you still get your pitch, but, but if you don't, hit your pitch then like it gets a lot harder to because you're really not going to see as many mistakes and that varies team to team you know some there were teams that like you could bang around a little bit that just like had you know you could tell they had they had not as many pitching prospects and then there were other teams that like were stacked to the point where like everyone in the bullpen was 90 97 96 97 um and I think I mean Montgomery was like one of those they had they had a guy uh Joel Poguero who was like he would hit 101 routinely it seemed like he threw every game I don't get how he was like this he was a small dude too and he just had an electric arm um they had they had some huge dude this guy Chris Chris um Mueller I think he was like throwing cutters at 97 so it was just it was just things you don't really see in high a like like very if you saw that in high a it would be like a very rare occasion like okay this yeah. guy's a, like he's probably young maybe he's figuring something out but he won't be here for long and in double A, you just, you see more and more of those. And it, it, it's just how it goes, you know, triple A, you see more and more. And then obviously the big leagues is like, everyone is everyone. like that. That's it's all the guys that. It's all the guys that do that and also spot it relatively well. Yeah. They have, they have the stuff and they have the control and they have everything. So um, yeah, it was like, it was a step, you know, it was, it was what everyone says is the biggest jump to make. And I, you know, I, I could get behind that. I think it's just like, you got no room to, you have a smaller margin for error. Like one, if you, you let them in, if you let them show, if you show a weakness, like 
the scouting reports also are much, much cleaner, much better. So once they find your weakness, they're going to hammer it and they'll do a better job of doing that. And then we have the six game series. So that's, that's the thing. The first, you show them like, okay, he's not hitting this pitch. you you bet you're going to see it until you do. And they're, they did a good job of like, um, I mean, that's why the pitching numbers were so good, you know, in that league and the hitting numbers were, you know, guys were, if you gave you at 275, you were like in the top five averages, which is insane. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it makes sense. I think the blue Wahoos, your, your team had, I think like a six something OPS. And it was just like, I'm watching the games. I'm like, how could they have any better of an OPS? It's ridiculous day in and day out. Like, especially when you have to face the Rays, you're going to just get, a litany of, of arms. I think Tommy Romero was another guy that was carving up that we faced all the way back in high school, uh, but has really put it together with the race too. And then he got bumped up to triple a, uh, and it's interesting seeing the pitcher side of things too, because he struggled his first couple of starts in triple a then settled in as well. But th- there's just this interesting adjustment period. I still do. Like you said, like the, the jump from high a to double a is nuts. Uh, but the other thing too, is these starters that throw 99 and are able to just locate it in that upper region of the zone. Like that's the, that's where you start seeing that the high spin starts to translate, right? Cause that's, that's where you're getting closer to the big leagues. And, and it seems like that's a major focus in the big leagues, right? Is, is the high VLO high spin fastballs elevated in the zone. You've told me that you think that's like the hardest pitch to hit in baseball, right? Is that high spin, high VLO fastball elevated? It, would yeah. you say that's the most difficult pitch to, to really get onto? Um, I mean, when you're seeing pitches like trying and slider, it's tough to say that a straight one or a relatively straight one is the hardest one. Yeah. But I think with the consistency that you see it, like it becomes, yeah, the they hardest. can locate it better. Yeah. Like the, 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 the sliders half the time you can take it and they, they want you to, to swing at a ball. So if you take it, but, but the fastball, you can't take it because like, they're going to put it right in the zone. And if you take it like that's strike one or strike three or whatever it is. So I think like, I mean, it makes sense. It's like it's the pitch you have the least amount of time to react to because a yeah. fastball, like you have to go A to B immediately. There's no if, if, if it's 99 in general, you do. But if it's 99 down, you, you have a little bit more time to like margin for error because you can your hands can drop a little bit and you can you can kind of maneuver the ball a little more when it's down in the zone. But when it's up and I think that's what they figured out was like, all right, these guys, they're just going to foul it off unless they're perfect with like, with how quickly they're getting into the zone and then how on time they are. And they're either going to foul it off, take it or, or swing and miss. So like that, it's, it's a really hard pitch to get good at hitting. And I think, I mean, our, we're our hitting coaches and coordinators are starting to hammer that point home where it's like, as hitters, like we need to, that's gotta be like the default is to be able to hit that pitch. And then you adjust yeah. from that, adjust down, you adjust slower but you got to be ready for the, the pitch you have the least, least amount of time to react to, which is what everyone wants to throw now. And, and it makes sense. And I, that was a pitch you, you turned around a few times. We we're talking about 99 miles an hour. You turn that around. Uh, you, you have some of the feel like, you know, you can do it, but that's where the back hip comes into effect too, right? If, you, if you're swinging off the back hip and you don't have as much movement, you want to make that as short. And like you said, A to B as possible. Right. And uh, it's amazing seeing that revolution through baseball now where we used to, see you wanted the long tall pitchers that had you know three pitches and now shorter guys with life on the fastball with it running up in a lower you know vertical attack angle seems to be the new thing max meyer for example who you got to see throw a little bit uh in pensacola before he got the bump up at the end of the season i mean that's a guy that i mean i'm sure you're happy he's on your team right because he's not the tallest dude in the world but has that low vertical attack angle fastball just takes off and then just the most outrageous slider ever uh, being in the outfield. I know you're not in center, but you're able to see a, a lot of the hitter reactions and things like that. I wanted to just ask you about Meyer. Cause I recently wrote an article on him. And I was kind of diving into uh, just his stuff. He's pretty darn good. Uh, yeah. I liked, I liked playing the outfield when he was pitching. <laughs> I, it was, yeah. Yeah. he was like, I, I gauging because like I didn't really I can really think of many balls I had to go after hard when he was on the mound like he I don't know what lefties hit off him but it couldn't have been well because anytime a lefty was up it seemed like he just like he had such good run 
So the ball is always going away from them. It's really hard to turn around. And it's also, you know, mid nineties with life and, and a lot of tail. And then he's got that slider and he started to, you know, started working a change up as well, which looked pretty good, which is kind of a new, you know, he was mostly a two pitch guy in college. So that was kind of the question mark. And it's clear that like, you know, he's going to be able to adjust and, and add new stuff. And he's that kind of a, that kind of a versatile type guy which is really fun to fun to play around play behind easy which uh that's what you want (laughs) what i loved what i loved is him and and for like a broadcaster too i that's always a broadcaster's dream is someone like meyer and also zach mccambly they work quick they catch the ball they're on the rubber they're ready to go again and i know that's great for fielders that's something i always love to see too just for baseball in general like we have all these rules to speed up the game by a minute And if you just had pitchers working decently quick, I think that would actually change everything. And I love watching Meyer and McCambly pitch because they work so quickly. They pound the zone and just get after it, which I'm sure is something you love in the field too. Uh, Can you talk a little bit about just how much of a difference it makes as a hitter when you know they have a third viable pitch? Because a lot of guys, they have three, everyone has three pitches for the most part, but it's always, or at least usually two they really trust and one that they're playing with that they'll mix in here and there. And you're probably not even worried about it in the box for those kind of guys. When you have a guy that really has confidence in that third pitch, how much more difficult does it make it for you in the box as a hitter, generally speaking? Yeah. I mean, I guess the right way to go about it is um, you pick what pitch you're going to go after and you don't really think about if he has four or five pitches. Cause like, there's no, that won't serve you at all, really, to think – your brain just can't – you know, you can't be ready for five pitches. Yeah. you got to be ready, you know, one or two that, that he's going to throw more frequently, that you know he will throw more frequently. So, like, to lefties, usually that's a fastball changeup. And then, yeah, some guys, yeah, it's, it's equal – it'll be 30-30-30, which is, like, it's rare, but, like, they'll throw everything equally. And for um, those guys, like, how much – like, from a pitcher's perspective, how much of an advantage is that when they're 30-30-30? Yeah, it get, I mean, it gets really – you can't really pick – you got to pick one of three. And it's kind of like – not like it's like 60% fastball and then like, you know, like 20% curveball, 10, 15% changeup. Like it's – then you could be like, all right, I'm going to sit hard. And then he likes – his his favorite off speed is this, so I'm going to sit on that. But like when, when they have like a very even chart, which is really, really like very rare. Like you really don't see a whole lot of that. Um but yeah, I mean, it's, you gotta, you almost have to go more location route. Like I'm going to look for it in this location that, that like, he seems to throw it a lot. And then like that way you kind of give yourself a little more room to, to be looking um, for multiple pitches because you're, you're going to have to, but I think that's, that's where back hip is so key. Cause like, if, if you're holding that and staying in place um, you're giving yourself like more time without gaining ground, like towards the pitcher, you can kind of like just ride it out and then you can see it for longer. And then, you know, that's where you see these guys like Soto make these really late looking swings. Like they look like they're at the last second because like they have so much control and they can read, 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 read. And then at the last second, be like, OK, now I'll launch instead of like, all right, I'm going to catch out in front every time. Sometimes you got to catch it right off your back leg. And that's yep. how like the re- to do it. And, and you've shown that like you have the power to do that, man, like where you can go the other way uh, and catch it really late and still leave the yard. I mean, you hit balls out that you didn't even connect with fully. <laughs> there was some that I'm looking at this thing in the air. I'm like, no way that thing gets out. And it ends up sailing out of there without a problem. Uh, and that's got to give you some confidence too, when you know, like, I don't need to get all of it to, to get it out of there and, and having that trust as well. Something I always love to ask uh, minor leaguers and, and any guys you know, at any level uh, from, from the pitching and hitting component, like who's one arm that impressed you the most on the mound. And then, maybe one hitter on your team or opposing hitter that you were like, wow, this guy can, this guy can really play. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, from a pitching standpoint, um, there's a few like closer wise, um, Peguero from Montgomery. I was just marveled at his ability to throw that hard and with like <laughs> a lot of run. Yeah. And, and two was in the same bullpen and very similar stuff. Like you were there, both 98, 99 consistently. Peguero was a little harder. Um, 
but they both threw, had a lot of run. Dotson had like this alien curveball that he threw at 85 that was like moved like it was moved, moved like it was thrown at 72. And yet it was like mid to upper 80s um, that he would break that out. So like those two guys in the same pen was not fun to face when it got to, you know, when the starter left the game. It used to be always like, oh, let's get the starter out of there. But like against them, it was like, let's like, let's get our hits off this guy. Cause like, who's coming in? It's going to be a lot harder. And then um, there's a couple other. Uh, Peyton Baddenfield was, was very good when he was there. And so was Tobias Myers. They were there. They both got moved up or Battenfield got traded um, shortly after. All these guys are with the Rays, I'm realizing. Yeah. <laughs> and yep. a really good. Um, and then Mississippi Braves had Spencer Strider who was really good. He was like a really lively spin rate fastball type guy um, with a really good slider too. Um, and then hitting wise, uh, hitting wise, I think like Jonathan Aranda yeah. with the, well, like he had our number. He always raked against us. Like he put on a show and we had our, we had a really good pitching staff. So like, that's saying a lot. Um, but he like, it seemed like he could hit anything. It, it's so crazy to me that like guys like Jonathan Aranda just fly under the radar. Like you watch him hit, he mashes, you talk to players who face him, he mashes. Like what, what does that guy need to do to get the respect he deserves? I mean, the guy hits and he's one of those dudes, right. That just, you, you couldn't get him out. Right. Like it was just, it was just no matter what anybody threw, it seemed like he was just on it. Yeah. He's a guy that like, you could, uh, he could mold his swing into fit to fit any pitch. Like he could like do a helicopter out on the front foot swing and like hit a double which is like you can't teach that like that's you yeah. can't practice that but like he had like just a very 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 advanced hit tool which, which was like pretty fun to watch always had to be ready in the outfield is there something you see across the board with these Rays pitchers uh that that kind of is is uniform I mean I know all of these guys are different in, in a lot of ways but it's not a coincidence that the Rays continue to churn out even if it's not a hot I mean Peyton Battenfield and Tobias Myers these weren't household names but they're guys that are going to be in big league rotations i think for the foreseeable future uh not with the rays they traded them because they have so many other dudes but uh, is there something that you see across the board with these rays guys like any commonalities sort of and at least with the with those two starters i think like i don't know what they i never faced them before but um they both had like very very spin rate heavy fastballs which is like they weren't super high velo guys. Uh, Myers would run up to like 93, 94, Battenfield, I don't even think that high. Um, but they would just get like they would get swing and misses on fastballs and like and foul balls. And like they they had good control of the top of the zone. I think all their pitchers controlled the top of the zone really well. And then um they had some guys that could spin it, you know, on 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 the I don't know what is that, the X axis instead of the Y axis. So like I actually just dot- double checked on Google today. X versus Y. And I was like, my, my parents wasted so much money. The Y is always the top. I knew. The, I always, the Y is vertical. The Y is vertical. Yeah. I, yeah. I was like, my, my parents wasted so much money. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Dodson, like those guys had the, the lateral tilt, like two seam that were very hard to seam. So I think, um, I mean, I think they just do a good job of like knowing what their pitchers like possess, like what the, if they, they if they possess- maximizing it. Yeah, like let's get the most out of that. Like let's not make him a four seam guy. Yeah. But Dodson would, would throw both. He would throw a four seam and a two seam. Um, so I think like they just do a really good job of with the fastball in general. I think that that'd be the best way to put it. Like they all can control the fastball. And I think that's like everyone throws the fastball majority of the time. That's a fact. So like the teams that do it the best, like they're gonna have the best staffs. hundred percent. And and that's the funny thing is we're we're seeing a lot of the better fastballs in baseball. I always talk about like Nestor Cortez, Ranger Suarez. So guys are throwing 90 miles an hour and they're getting tons of swings and misses on the fastball. Yeah. I think we're realizing more and more a plus fastball doesn't necessarily just have to be velo. It could be better off. You could be better off with just the right shape on a fastball. Uh, and that seems to be the thing that the Rays have really figured out uh, before we hop on to stream yard uh, and wrap up this, this episode, a little bit of what you're doing right now. So you're talking to me from a hotel room in Jupiter, you're getting better uh, with the hand. You're going to be ready to go in the next week or so you're going to run some, what, some simulated games, some other things to, to kind of get ready. What exactly is going on in this uh, Marlins camp, so to speak, I guess, uh, as you're getting after it. Uh, Yeah. It's just like, everyone's kind of starting to roll in. It's like school starting or something like all the pitchers 
get here, get back in their rhythms. A lot of the pitchers are, are starting to ramp up, um, ramp up throwing. So it's cool to like, you know, it's cool to see some life in the complex. You know, we have camps there in like December and it's just like, it's we kind of weird, you know, we're the only, there's only like 20 guys there. Um, and it's starting to feel normal again. But um, I think the purpose of this, like I'm here this week, just doing rehab for my hand, trying to get it fully ready for when I start hitting on Friday. Um, and it's starting to, it's almost, almost there. It feels good. Um, and then starting Monday, all the other position players will be here. Um, or not all of them, but um, all the guys that are coming to this camp. And then we'll, I imagine it'll kind of just be um, getting us ready for spring training, like kind of an early mini spring training, just to like get, get swings, get eyes on us. Um, I'm excited for that. Excited to hit on the field again. And I'm sure we'll be doing a lot of high fastball work. That, yeah. that seems like all we're going to do, which is, a good thing because that's what um that's that's what everyone needs to do so uh it's kind of just getting back in the swing of things and uh getting ready for spring which is only a month and a half away pretty yeah, soon. Well, for, for you guys the lockout doesn't affect right so you're gonna have the minor league spring training i mean the hope would be that you get invited and get to to be in big league spring training but if that's delayed you're getting after it in minor league spring training right yeah absolutely we're we're full go no matter what so hopefully they figure it out up there, but if not, I mean, they will, eventually, but we'll be, but, yeah, we'll be you'll, you'll be ready to go by then. Right. And at some point, uh, yeah. and that, that we'll that's ready. the good news on that end, but it, it's, it's a little bit frustrating and, uh, that's something that we're waiting on, on our end of things too. So the good news is we got minor week season, no matter what, and I'm excited for that. And we're getting closer and closer to that. Really excited to see what you're going to do out there, man. And, uh, I know Marlins fans are as well. Uh, you got big things coming and we're going to go make the jump over to StreamYard to nerd out about hitting a little bit more for the next 20 minutes. Uh, I would give a, a full like farewell, but I'm about to talk to you in 10 minutes. And also you're going to come on this show for sure. Like whenever you're bored on the road or whatever. Um, so you're, you know, you're welcome. It's one of those open invites type of things. So yeah. hopefully people enjoyed the interview. Hopefully they don't get sick of your voice. Cause you're going to be on here from time to time throughout the season, especially during your next 10 That's for 13, 10, bad. 10 home runs in 13 games. If you do, when you do that again this year, I'm going to have to have you on, uh, but looking forward to having you on through the season, man. And uh, let's get on to StreamYard. All right, let's do it.